This is the Choose FI Radio Podcast, Episode 4. Pay off $168,000 in student loan debt and get off the hamster wheel. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the studio. This is Brad Barrett from ChooseFI.com. And in this show, we're going to actually interview Jonathan, my co-founder of ChooseFI. Hey, Brad. Hey. So, yeah, we're going to turn the tables on you. In a prior episode, we interviewed me. But I think your story is much more common and much more interesting to people out there. I think this will be a very valuable episode. So, you know, just want to paint the picture of, of where you were when you graduated pharmacy school. As I understand it, it was August 2013. You had just graduated from VCU Pharmacy School. You have this great career path ahead of you, according to the rules of society, right? Right, The, yeah. the American dream, the hamster wheel, as you call it. Love calling it the hamster wheel. <laughs> but you had $168,000 in student loan debt. In student, yeah. And you know what's crazy about that? That is essentially, for some people, a mortgage. That is three or four car payments. That is just this massive, almost incomprehensible amount of debt to have. And, and, and I say that knowing that there are other people that have 200,000, 300,000, $400,000 in debt, you know, this was my number, but it is just a crazy, and I can't wait to dive down into some of the details. That is a crazy amount of debt to have without any sort of asset to tie to it other than your, you know, your license. We're not talking about having a, a mortgage or a home or something that you could sell to pay it off. It is on you. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. That's a huge number. So at that point, you were at minimum 168000 in debt. Right. And, you know, I think based on some schedules I've seen, your net worth was was even more negative than that. But yeah. you can talk about that. So what I'm curious about is how you got there. So not only physically, where did you get the debt from? Is it just from graduate school? Was it from undergrad? But But really the psychology of where did you go from when you were, I don't know, let's say 18, right? So you, right. you make a decision for college. You make the decision to go to pharmacy school to take on all this debt. Talk me through how you got to that point when you were 168K in debt on August 2013 and what your hopes were for the future at that point. And just tell the audience how you got there. Yeah, thanks for uh, setting me up for that. So this is going to be a lot of fun to answer because um, this is my life. I, so I wanted to be successful and it was a known fact that in order to be successful, you know, you know, you needed to go into the medical career. Now that just was a, it's a vibrant industry. There's a lot of need for it. And so that is really what I put all my, my hopes and my dreams in, into, into being that person. And along the way, I realized the magnitude of, of, of the debt that I was incurring, but that was always presented to me as the best option. That is the best option that America has for you. If you take out all this debt and you go and you get this degree, you will be successful. You will be in that top 1% or, you know, or, or whatever, whatever number you want to throw out there. But that was the plan. And so I did that, followed the rules, took out the student loan debt. I got the grades and I got out and I got my degree and I got my job. But along with that, with that degree and that job was this, this debt that had now been snowballing on me and was 168,000. And if I can give you a number to put that in perspective for the people that are listening to today, that is a thousand dollars of interest a month. A thousand dollars in interest a month for the rest of eternity. If you don't pay it down, you will always have to spend an extra thousand dollars a month on interest. And so, in order to to pay that thousand dollars in interest, you're going to have to earn thirty five percent more because it's post tax dollars, and because you're in a high tax bracket, there are no deductions for you. You are phased out of the deductions. In order to pay that student loan, that thousand dollars a month, you're going to need to earn thirteen hundred dollars. Because 300 of it's going to go back to the government and taxes. And then what you have left, you're going to need to pay them. And, and you have to pay off principal. And, you, and on top yeah. of that, you have to pay off principal. That's for eternity. So if you want to then get rid of that and have your life be less expensive, uh, you're going to need to start doing something with the principal. And you have $168,000 in principal. So it's intense. It's intense. And so I think one of the things you realize after you graduate and you stop and you start working is what post-tax dollars in a high marginal tax bracket look like, really. And you have this salary that you're told that you're getting, but then you actually only end up with this. 
And then because you have a car payment and you have a, a mortgage and you have a food bill and, and maybe some people have kids and they got other expenses and they, they've delayed gratification on, on a lot of these big purchases for so long because they had to do an extra four years of school. So now, you know, maybe they're 28, they've, they've been trying to hold off on starting a family. Maybe they held off on getting the car and they've been driving their beaters around. It's very difficult to resist the temptation of going far the other way, but you know, you really just don't have as much as you think you have. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about it. And just going back for a second. So the 168K was all from pharmacy school or was that from undergrad as well? I actually was pretty, try to be pretty smart about um, a lot of stuff. I did the community college for two years, which kept oh, my nice. bills pretty low. Uh, my parents helped me with one year of undergraduate and I only needed the second year. So I really only came out with about maybe eight to 10 grand of undergrad. I know a lot of people have a lot more than that, but that was my particular situation. Uh, so most of it was pharmacy school. Okay. It ended up being probably 130, 140. Cause some of that interest that accrues while you're actually in school and then, you know, gets yep. piled on to the principal at the oh, end. Oh, that makes sense. So, okay, so you graduate from undergrad. Did you go immediately to pharmacy school or did you take some time? And, you know, talk us through the decision to, to go to pharmacy school. And were there different options that would have been cheaper potentially? Were there things that you could have done differently? Maybe? Yeah, what could I have done differently? You know, I, for me... I, in general, I think it was a pretty good decision. You know, my plan actually worked. I have a six figure income. I have a lot of student loan debt, but it's possible for me to pay that. And in fact, I have, um, I, we can talk about that a little bit, but I've basically wiped it out in about three and a half to four years. And I just put everything I had at it. I used some techniques to reduce my living expenses. So, I mean, you could say that my plan was a success and that it was worth it because I'll have this income potentially for the rest of my working career. And it's a really good income. But I think what I learned from it was really to analyze your motives for doing something and analyze was this the best way of doing it? Was this really necessary? Because I'm 32 years old and I'm essentially now back to even, you know, so I delayed working so I could get this degree. Now I've got the degree and it took me four years now to pay down all the student loans. And so now I'm 32 really before I had my first real job essentially. And I'm really kind of just starting from scratch, building something. And, and I have choices now. I can just continue with this career. Or I could try to start something new. But the question is, you know, was this the best choice? Do I enjoy doing this? Is this what I want to do? Or would I like to go off in a different direction? And I think probably that question is still being answered. But for those of you that haven't made that choice yet, I think it's a really interesting conversation to have to think about why it is you're doing something. And are you doing it because America and our culture tells you you have to, or are you doing it because that's your passion and that's what you love? And it's just a good conversation to have. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think... A crucial point Jonathan just mentioned is the economic concept of opportunity cost, mm. right? So uh, it's what you're foregoing by making a decision. So Jonathan went to four years of pharmacy school, is that correct? Four years of pharmacy school. Four years of pharmacy school and then three plus years to pay down the debt, which is frankly a miracle that he did that. And we'll talk about that certainly in, in this interview. But let's just say that seven years just to get back to zero. And obviously he has this degree that now enables him to get a six figure plus salary, but seven years that if he didn't make that decision, he could have been earning money all the while or learning other skills like creating a podcast or creating a right. website as, as you've as you've done over the last X number of months that cost essentially nothing, right? I mean, you got- Oh my goodness, and think about that. I mean, just, just think about it. So essentially I have purchased and studied my way into getting this income that makes me six, that'll make me six figures. But the purchasing costs, aside from the educational component and the time component, but the purchasing cost for that was $168,000. So that's a, it's a $168,000 investment in order to earn a six figure income. Is that the only way to do that? So let's say that your motivation for going into a, you know, a medical profession was really just that you wanted to earn a six figure income. You didn't particularly want to go to med school or to pharmacy school. You really just wanted to earn a six figure income is paying $168,000 and giving up eight years of your life. Is that the best way to get a six figure income? And is there a more efficient way of doing it? I have to imagine there's a better way. I mean, there's certainly a better way outside of the industry, right? I think that's what you're alluding to. And tons of different fields and knowledge that you, you can pick up that don't cost this money. I was an accountant and I just went to undergrad. I didn't need to do any type of uh, postgraduate work to get my CPA license. And I came out of college making, I forget what it was, $45,000, which was not a ton of money, but for having essentially no debt undergrad. And I lived at home for two years. So I made 45 grand. The only thing that I was giving up was was taxes at that point, which is fairly small on that kind of income, I was able to save 90% of my 
of my income. That's that point, just right? awesome. Which is crazy. When you when you start to think about things differently, start thinking about savings. That's one of my favorite things to discuss is your your savings rate and whether or not it's post tax or pre tax, all that stuff. But savings rate can be everything. And it is a podcast all by itself. It's one that we're going to discuss at some point. But just think about that, a 90% savings rate and just run a couple math equations with that down the line and see what that looks like. It's it's unbelievable. It means that essentially just, just, just to go right to the ending and spoil the end of the story for you, it means that you could retire what you need to work one year to stay retired for 10 years. Is that what it means basically? Yeah, yeah essentially. And obviously I wound up eventually not saving 90% of my right, income, but, right. but those two plus years that I lived at home really transformed my entire financial life because I was able to save whatever it was, 30 grand a year. I mean, that's a huge amount of money for a 22 year old kid. Like, Can you imagine being 22 years old and because of a couple of decisions you made from the age of 12 to 20, you are starting out life with a hundred grand in the bank. I mean, yeah. that is an entirely doable proposition if you're given the, til- the the skills and you have somebody model it for you so you can kind of see what it might look like. I, I just, I think it's unbelievable. Yeah, and that's, that's the concept of opportunity cost. So Jonathan is starting at 32 now, essentially where I was at 22. Now, albeit my income was dramatically less than his is now, but that's an interesting conversation to have on the path to financial independence. Absolutely, and you know what the cool thing is? Y'all may not know it, but there's so many people out there that have done exactly that. And we're going to find them and we're going to talk to them. Nice. Yeah, for sure. And one thing that I'm sure you've picked up in the last X number of minutes here on this interview is Jonathan, we said, came out with 168K of student loan debt in August of 2013. We're recording this in December of 2016 now, right? So yep. three yep. and a, a third year later. And he has essentially paid it down to almost zero. Yeah. Right? I think, you know, he is somewhere in the vicinity of $20,000 left, which will be paid off in short order. Yeah. Now, my question to you, Jonathan, I'm sure everyone in the is wondering this is how the heck did you do that? Yeah. Like, what is, what is the mechanism to pay back 140 plus thousand dollars in three and a third years? One, marry somebody that's more frugal than you. That's a great tip. Yeah, I have that as well. My wife is makes me look like a, a big spender. My wife's amazing. She's way more frugal than I am, and it's awesome. But aside from that and moving forward with some of the other stuff, it takes, uh, gosh, I'm going to say three bullet points, but there might be a fourth one after I get to the third one. I'll be honest, this is going to be a little bit of a confession. I'm really not the most frugal person. Um, I'm a reluctant frugalist. I have an article that y'all can read on choosefi.com about that. But I am very disciplined and I hate recurring expenses. I don't mind spending money one time on something, but I hate bleeding money out month to month. All right. So first, find out what your life cost. Uh, I started by simply just tracking our expenses for you know my family using Mint. And we categorized every transaction for three months just to kind of find out, you know, what our actual costs were. And so just to share some of those with y'all so y'all kind of can compare and contrast. We were at, you know, $1,300 a month in rent, um, $150 a month for a cell phone bill, $120 a month for the cable bill, $350 car payment, $60 gym membership, $35 a month for water, car insurance, hundred and some odd dollars a month, electric bill, $200 a month. Food bill was approaching $800 a month. And the student loan bill, which was that massive one, was all the way up at $2,000 a month. So that's where it was. That's where you started at. And frankly, that that approaches almost $60,000 a year in just recurring monthly expenses. And so once you have figured out what your actual life is costing you, then the next step is you need to focus on how can I decrease that? Because you have two approaches if you want to try and get more to your student loans. One, you can increase your income, but that is inefficient because you're already in a high tax bracket. So once you're already spending a certain amount of money, if you want to send extra to student loans in order for you to send maybe $100 extra to student loans, you need to earn, I don't know, almost $140 in order to do that. So it gets increasingly expensive. And so you should always look at first at how can you minimize those expenses and see if you can decrease what your life is actually costing on a a month-to-month basis. And if you can do that successfully, Successfully, you'll be paying off your loan with cheaper dollars. So that's what we focused on. And we were able to get rid of, by looking at that, we were able to get rid of a bunch of that stuff. Some of that may be standing out to you, the audience, as wasteful already. So for me, when I look at that now, I see the cell phone and the cable is ridiculous. So, you know, just cut the cable. Who needs cable? This is 2016. There's a million different ways that you can watch anything you want on the internet, including at bare minimum, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime. You just, you just don't need cable anymore. It's just a way to feed you commercials for eight hours a day. 
So we got rid of that. The cell phone bill, that's also ridiculous. I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous. And there's a lot of options to reduce your cell phone bill. So if you're paying $150 a month for your cell phone bill for you and your spouse, come on, figure out a way to do better. And if you're saying to yourself, well, I have to have my iPhone, come on. We're talking about your life freedom here. Do you really need to, to, to spend $150 a month on a cell phone bill? So we moved them down to um, Republic Wireless Project Fi type programs. And, you know, we spend about $20 a month for phone, maybe 50 to $60 a month total. We also took a look at some of the other things. We decided that the gym membership, we really weren't getting a lot of use out of. So first we ended up moving it to a, um, like a, a smaller gym that was only $10 a month. We decided we didn't need all the features that were being offered by that $60 a month Megaplex. And actually at this point, we've just cut it completely and we're focusing on more functional fitness and things that we can do at home. Um, we also crushed our food bill. We figured out how to get that down dramatically. We decreased how many times we we're going to the restaurants and we focused on paying off the car and we focused on our electric bill and, and trying to find out why that was so high. Was there a way to decrease that? So the other thing you got to do is you got to figure out how to make that simple um, and how to control your money to dictate where your money goes. And so Honestly, when you're in this position, pay, trying to pay down a, a dramatic amount of debt, you really do need to avoid credit cards. Uh, credit cards, there's a statistic that says that people spend on average an extra 12% when they use credit cards. And I can definitely see how that would be true. But even if you're not doing that, the problem with credit cards is that they give you too much flexibility on the front side. And you need to be very disciplined and focused. You need to have a set amount of money and use that specific amount of money. And so debit cards really are better. And the specific system I used was to not just have one bank account with one debit card, but to actually open up about five or six different bank accounts. My bank lets me open them for free. And I would give each one of those a name. So you had a food account, you had a gas account, you had personal spending account, and each one of those got a set amount of money. And that's what you had to live on for those 15 days. And we did it, you know, I get paid bi-weekly, but bi-weekly doesn't really play nice with other stuff. So we did on the 1st and the 15th, you would get an auto transfer of a specific amount of money that we had pre pre-decided. And that's what you had to live off of. And we did that successfully for about two and a half to three years. And what we would do as soon as I would get paid, I would auto transfer the specific amount to the bank accounts. And then everything else past that, I would go ahead and just send off the student loans. I mean, it was gone and just like that. And then I would mark it down that I'd paid that. And that was my little win. So that was bullet point one and two. Uh, bullet point three is focus and intensity because you can do something really well for one month or for two months, maybe even three months, but to do something really well and have that intense focus, which is what it requires for three years, it is boring. It is not fun. There's nothing glamorous about paying down debt. There's something kind of glamorous about investing, even if it's in index funds, which are as boring as you can get. It's kind of glamorous in that you can visualize your money earning money for you. But if you're paying down debt, you have to look for other metrics in order to keep yourself engaged in this process. And so I had to come up with whole new systems to look at to say, hey, I'm really making progress because you just, you send the money off and it just disappears. And then maybe it goes down a little bit, but it's hard to track what it's really doing. And every single time you choose to send them that money for that student loan payment, that's money that you don't have for vacation. You don't have to go eat out or, or, or do other stuff that is more fun and enjoyable. Uh, you know, I, so I came up with a few different metrics that I use and I have an Excel sheet that um, we've actually posted on choosefi.com that y'all can download for free. If you, if you have a lot of debt that you want to pay down and you want a tool to help you stay focused and on track it's available there for a free download. But basically I looked at one, I looked at my total balance, obviously. And then I created an Excel sheet to help me track what my daily interest accrual rate was. And then I put that into perspective. So, you know, when it started, it was almost a thousand dollars a month in interest that I was paying regardless of my balance. But then as I got it down, maybe if you look at a monthly interest accrual rate of a thousand dollars a month, that is almost what, $30 a day in interest relatively. So after I would make an extra thousand or $2,000 payment, maybe it would go down to like $29 a day or $27. So I would just track every single little win and say, you know what? Now my monthly interest accrual has gone down from a thousand dollars a month down to $300 a month. So now I've moved from having a home mortgage down to a car payment. You just got to visualize it. You got to track it. You got to look for wins. You got to keep yourself motivated. If you can project out every payment you're going to make for the next eight or nine payments, and you're not just doing your auto payments, which give you a discount, but you're also doing extra payments based around your bi-weekly pay schedule. If that's how you get paid, you got to look at how those impacted. And by paying it early, as soon as you get paid, the first thing you do is you go and 
you send that student loan payment in because there's a daily cost, a daily cost to not sending in those payments. So it takes intensity, it takes focus, and it just takes tracking the little wins so you can keep your eye on the prize. And so way basically what we found out when we started is that our cost of living initially was probably close to 60,000. And when we were able to implement some of these packs and smarter choices, we were able to dramatically cut that cost of living down into that we were able to live fairly comfortably and sustainably for around 35 to 38, 35 to 40 grand a year. And then just any, everything else went to student loans. And we had some costs already baked in, but I did have high earning potential, but I also had a high tax rate. And if I was just able to, to live a, a entry level middle class lifestyle, it became very possible just to stay incredibly focused on those student loans and get them paid off in a short amount of time. Yeah, that's fascinating. So obviously the the most important goal here was paying off the student loans, but were you saving otherwise? Were you, did you have an emergency fund? Did okay. Yeah, this is actually interesting. And I'm not saying that I have the right way of doing this, but this is what I came up with. I have a pretty safe job. It's not going anywhere. And while initially I kept like a thousand or $2,000 in emergency fund, because I was actually, one of the things I was doing is I was paying ahead on these student loans. And then what I would do after I was paid ahead is I would call a company and say, Hey, I'm paid ahead. Can you reduce my monthly payment? And so they continued to reduce that monthly auto payment down. And because I was sending them so much more than what I was actually required to do. I mean, this is a 20, this was a 10 year or 20, this was a 10 year loan. I think I had, I had consolidated it down to a 10 year loan, but I was paying it off in five years is what was my goal initially. And because I was, I was paying so much more towards it. I found that I didn't really feel like I needed the emergency fund because I could very easily put it on a credit card if I need to. And I'm not advising that, but I'm just saying that's what I did. I could put it on a credit card if I need to, and I could very easily just stop making the extra payments because these were extra payments. These were not to meet, these were not to meet any amount that I had to meet in order to pay my minimum bill. I was paying far more than was necessary. So I could easily just pay that credit card if I, if I had to use that in between my pay periods. And so I guess things could have gone south, but I also could have, I had 10 years to pay these loans off. I was paying them off in five and I did it closer to three. So because it was for a relatively short period of time, I just kind of focused on that and it could have bit me in the butt, but it, it didn't. Right. You reduce the likelihood of that happening. Certainly with having a, a stable income and being I am, the credit cards. But. I am very much looking forward to having a very, very strong, vibrant emergency fund, but I'm also very excited about these things being done in the next month or two. And so I'll probably pivot from getting these loans done to hiking back up that emergency fund, maybe do, you know, a couple thousand dollars. It is so interesting though, how people have different levels of safety. I think that's one thing you're going to, you as the audience out there are going to learn about Jonathan and I are, you know, we are, while we are similar in our ultimate goals, we are different in how we carry them out. Radically different, right. I'm sure. And I think, as he says, he's the reluctant frugalist. I think I'm beyond frugal by nature. I'm also much more conservative than he is with money. So for me, there's always that level of safety. Like I could not sleep at night if I didn't have an emergency fund. Now, you know, I don't always term it an, emer an emergency fund, but it's money sitting in a, an account that I can access fairly quickly. Yeah. And that's often to my detriment, frankly. I think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, my wife is probably more frugal and more conservative financially than I am. So we keep way more in cash and cash equivalents than we should. You know, I can only advocate for Brad's plan. And my wife would agree with Brad 100%. She would like that. I, you know, and I don't even really, I can't even, I'm really can't even convince you that I did that the right way. But, but it worked. But it worked. <laughs> I'm here. Nothing went wrong, God willing, and won't go wrong. So I'm very excited to be more like Brad going into 2017 and have the emergency fund. All right. So here we are, right? Here we so are. Here we are. You are going to have this crazy loan balance paid off in the next X number of yeah, months, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll be at zero. You still have a boatload of money pouring in because obviously you've been using all this money to pay off these loans. Every yeah, year. yeah, absolutely. Where do you go from here? Like what is it to set up that. an emergency fund? Is it, it is, you know, it is. What are we doing? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. So there's a couple things that are going to happen. Um, as soon as these loans are done, I think you pivot next into trying to get three to five grand in an emergency fund. And that's enough for our expenses. You know, if we've calculated that our living expenses are around 36,000 a year with our, you know, 36,000 to 40,000 a year with our, with our mortgage included. And that means that I probably need to have around $3,000 a month. Um, I'm probably going to just try to get to that three to six grand 
you know, put that aside. And while I'm doing that, I'm still building this blog and this podcast and some other stuff. And the amazing thing about trying to figure out when do you start a business? When do you just focus on getting an emergency fund build up? Um, the, the cool thing is when you do something that's relatively low cost, like a blog and a podcast, you can do them concurrently. And even if you're not ready to actually launch something like that, you can start learning the skills to do it. And so you need to always be learning. So this 2017 is a crazy exciting year for me. It's the first year where now all of my energy is, is going to be actually put into not just something as boring as paying down student loans. I mean, if you're in debt, you know, you need to pay it off and, and you need some motivation. Go to the site. I've got some great materials there to help you stay focused in getting it paid down. But it's also probably one of the most boring things in the world to do. And once you're actually at that finish line and you can taste it, there are so many opportunities that open up for you. And I'm excited that you're going to get to experience that. Um, and so that that is what I was pursuing. And I think we're right there at the door with that. Nice. And yeah, that's what's so cool about this podcast. You know, we talk about, and the, and the website, we talk about experiments and financial independence. You're literally going to get to see what Jonathan does. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can do the math real quick, right? I mean, he probably has easily 50 grand a year, right? That he, he paid off 168K in three yeah. change years. We're talking 50 grand a year. Yeah. That in 2017, he's going to have 50 grand that he's going to save approximately. Yeah, right? These no, that's probably about right. So what is he going to do with that? And I, I'm going to find this fascinating. You know, we talk about the fishbowl, right? Like to me, I, I can't wait to see what he does. You're right. And we're going to just see what happens and we're going to share it with you. I mean, one of those things is going to be creating new streams of income. It's going to be creating something like the blog and the podcast and seeing what goes. And, and you can do that because you have, you're starting from this platform now of, of freedom. You don't owe the bank anything anymore. You're debt free. So now it's let your creativity go wild and see what you want to do. And you know what? Even if you if you mess up and one of your projects tanks, it's probably not going to cost you $168,000. You have some room to experiment, make some mistake, learn from it like Brad did in a prior episode and go forward with a new project. So, you know, I've been listening to the podcast, the three hour car flip. Fantastic. Lots of fun to listen to. I'm going to try something simple like that. We're going to try. We're going to practice what we preach and do the Vanguard um you know, and, yeah, gosh, I can't put funds. those letters together. I know what they are. I just can't put them together. And uh, we're going to do that one. We're going to maybe do a fundraise, a lending club. I mean, we're going to, my goal is to have five passive streams of income. They don't have to be a lot. They don't have to be something crazy, but actually be able to have a monthly statement that shows five different streams of income that are passive. They're, 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 just, they're taking care of themselves moving out of 2017 and 2018. And so we are going to build this out and we're going to share what we're doing, how it works, what steps you can take. We're going to find people that have already done it and we're going to bring them on the show. We're going to learn from them and we're going to share all of that with you. I mean, it, it's absolutely going to be an, an amazing year for Chooseify. Yeah, we are beyond excited. We're so glad you're here. And yeah, hopefully this was a good introduction to Jonathan where he's been what he's done and where he's going. And I'm excited to see to see what he does. And, and I hope you are too. So yeah, thank you for listening. I want to get a copy of the Excel sheet that I use to pay down $168,000 in student loan debt. Go to choosefi.com forward slash 004. You can get the Excel file as well as the show notes from today's episode. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and to retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online.